Hey, 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 everybody. Today is Thursday, January the 4th, and you are watching the first episode of FCM Prime News for the year. Yay! And you know what that means. New Year's resolutions. I have one. It's to start FCN Prime News on time. <laughs> but listen, it's not because I'm trying to be a better person. It's because FCN Prime, FCN has something brand new for you guys on every Thursday. J. Co., our resident sports guy, has something new for you guys on Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. He's going to be bringing you uh, NBA basketball, all things basketball, stats, sports, arguments, all of that. So stay tuned until 7.30 at 7.30 to watch the show. All right, my teleprompter is flying right now, so we're gonna have to stop it for just a second and catch up to this, because it is flying. But I wanna talk more about J. Cole's new show today at 7.30. Uh, it's called True Baller Thursdays, and it's going to be everything you need to know, wanna know about NBA basketball. So please, after FCM Prime News, stay tuned. You want to see Jayco go in on the new show True Baller uh I almost said True Baller status True Baller Thursdays with that you know how we do it FCM Prime News we want you to definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel we are official now with the vanity URL because we hit 100 subscribers go to the fifth column network on YouTube and click that subscribe button for us you will be able to get notifications every single time we upload a new video every time we go live. You do not want to miss anything that we're planning for 2018 because it's going to be great. Uh, with that, we're going to roll into our news for today because I don't have much time like I used to because Jayco's going to come in with something hot and new for you guys. So for our first story in crime and law today, there's a family in New Jersey that is definitely uh, suffering uh, this new year as on Christmas on New Year's Eve, uh, their 16 year old son shot his father, his mother, his 18 year old sister, and a 70 year old friend of the family who lived with them, all at close range with a semi automatic rifle, killing them in cold blood. Three others who were present in the home that night were able to escape with their lives. That's Scott's older brother, grandfather, and another family member in their 20s. The shooting happened about 20 minutes before the clock struck midnight on New Year's Day. Prosecutors intended to charge the 16-year-old as an adult. This new year has been a chilly one, and a number of people have been charged with neglect of their pets, as seen as their animals are kept outside uh, in frozen temperatures. A New Hampshire woman is being charged with neglecting the welfare of 22 of her dogs that she kept in a barn with no heat, no water, and uh, no food. Jennifer Choate was already charged with one count of animal cruelty last month when 36 dogs burned in a fire on her property and eight other dogs were seized. So how many animals has this woman had? She's got like, right, 36 plus 22 plus, listen, that's almost 70 animals. Y'all go look up how many animals were involved with Michael Vick's dog fighting. And meanwhile, I'll be looking for some comparable outrage. Well, it is now a new year for many people. Their resolutions involve finding love. And if that's you, beware of crazy people who overstay their welcome, or you may find yourself with a date that costs you more than $300,000. This woman uh, had a date with a trial attorney that didn't end the way that she liked. When he said, ah, it's time for you to go home, he called her Uber and she lost it. This woman decided to hide in this man's mansion so she could wait until the Uber left. When the Uber did leave, he found her and said, I'm calling another Uber, and she went on a rampage. Another issue, can you stop it for me? Went on a rampage. She ended up pulling down $300,000 worth of artwork in this man's home, including two original Andy Warhols, Warhol paintings, and poured red wine all over them. She then took two statues, two of them, both worth $20,000 each, and threw them across the room shattering them both. Yikes. This woman has now been arrested for criminal mischief. She is out of jail on $30,000 bond. The attorney she was dating has represented many high profile clients and he hosted a fundraiser at his mansion for the now president Donald Trump during his presidential elections and even donated $250,000 to his campaign. Seems like you reap what you sow. We're gonna take a quick commercial break and when we come back, we're going to continue our crime and law segment and definitely go into our politics segment where we're going to break down what is on the agenda for U.S. Congress the top of this year.
love dating, one of the best things about a new relationship is how you can't get enough of the new person. You just want to be with them all the time and everywhere. Well, this Alabama couple of only six months feels the exact same way. Tiffany Bates, age 31, and Clifton Bridges, age 19, were arrested after refusing to stop having sexual intercourse during their grandmother's funeral ceremony. Oh yeah, y'all heard it, their grandmother. These two are first cousins. Employees of the funeral home complained that the two were having loud sex, perturbing funeral services, and scaring the guests as they indulged in sexual activity only meters away from where the ceremony was being held. The employees said that the boy just kept pounding her like she was in a porn movie and she was <laughs> screaming loud and said they were both high as beep and they were high on methamphetamines, they were high on GHP and some other drugs. They've been charged with lewd and obscene behavior, disturbing the peace in public places and drug possessions. If you're wondering where are the charges for incest, well, Alabama has no law against first cousins engaging in sexual relationships. Gross. <laughs> well, it's time for one of my favorite segments, politics and current events. Trump and Congress face a long to-do list in the year 2018. The Republican-led Congress have set their sights on an infrastructure initiative and welfare reform as two of their top legislative priorities for 2018. Lawmakers also must pass budget bills and other unfinished business. They've got to tackle that after this holiday break. Here is what the legislative agenda is looking like on Capitol Hill for this top uh, of 2018. First up, infrastructure. Business groups are very, very eager for Trump and Congress to tackle a major transportation bill that would spur construction of highways, airports, and other infrastructure. Republicans, though, have yet to lay out how much, how they're gonna pay for such an ambitious project when traditional funding mechanisms such as an increase in the gas tax remain politically unpopular. Another item on the agenda for Capitol uh, Hill is welfare reform. After passing the very massive tax cut package that we are all familiar with now, House Speaker Paul Ryan and other conservative Republicans are eager to overhaul food stamps and other anti-poverty programs Lawmakers could add work requirements for able-bodied uh, recipients of welfare or lump a range of programs together to give states more control over how they are administered. Another item on the agenda, oh, before that, they could run into a brick wall in the Senate, though, with uh, reform of welfare, where Republicans narrowly, 51 to 49 majority, requires them to work with Democrats on most of these issues uh, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell said last month that he didn't think welfare reform could make that kind of a headway because Democrats are already portraying the effort as an attack on the poor uh, coming on the heels of the tax rewrite that delivered its biggest benefits to businesses and the wealthy people. Outside of Congress, Trump could, on his own, trim benefits by reducing the time people are eligible for government aid and requiring them to provide much more frequent updates on their efforts to find work. Government funding is also on the agenda. Lawmakers have been unable to pass detailed spending bills that are supposed to be approved on an annual basis, so they've been operating on a series of temporary spending measures since October the 1st. Republicans are pushing for a big increase in military spending, while Democrats say that uh, it should be matched in a hike in domestic programs and environmental protection and public housing. Uh, but however, the bill needs to be fixed because the money runs out on January the 19th. Uh, another issue, stabilizing Obamacare. This is a big one, as we know the Republicans have been trying to repeal Obamacare since Trump has gotten into office. Republican leaders have promised the Senate to vote on a bipartisan plan uh, to try to make a tougher sell to the House in trying to stabilize Obamacare. Immigration is also on the list, as Trump has removed protections from some 800,000 uh, young uh, people, particularly children, giving Congress until March the 5th to come up with legislation that could prevent the so-called dreamers from deportation. Democrats insist that any spending bill must include permanent protections for the dreamers, while Republicans say the issue should be dealt with separately and should be paired with provisions for stronger border security and new restrictions on legal immigration. Uh, the debt ceiling is also on the agenda as the federal government could have trouble paying its bills and face default if Congress doesn't raise its borrowing authority in the coming months, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office 
has estimates that the Treasury Department will run out of cash soon, uh, right around late March or early April, if Congress doesn't act by then. The last item on the agenda for those who want to know what's going on in Capitol Hill is children's health. Congress is also struggling to agree on the funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program, which many of us uh, know or have read as CHIP. Funding for that program, which provides coverage to almost 9 million low-income children, has been temporarily extended until March 31st. Whew, that's a nice little agenda for Congress at the top of 2018. Um, so look for those issues to be decided on Capitol Hill for those who are interested in politics. The biggest issue in politics, though, out of Capitol Hill is that bill, the tax bill. Uh, much to the chagrin uh, and despair of many middle class and low income Americans, uh, that bill did pass. The state of New York, however, has announced that it will sue over the federal tax overhaul, calling it unconstitutional and an assault on New York. Tap screen. Governor Cuomo, in his State of the Address last Wednesday, continued to rail against the approval of the tax bill, saying it was designed to hurt blue states like his. The Democratic government said he looks to reform New York's own tax code, perhaps through the payroll tax, in response to the federal action. Republicans, however, have disagreed with the governor's uh, assertion, saying that most New Yorkers will see lower income taxes under the federal overhaul, as the standard deduction has been nearly doubled and the income tax rates are falling. Time will tell how this new uh, tax bill will affect us all. It's likely that it will see some benefits in the beginning, but soon it will all hit us very hard. Speaking of lawsuits, Paul Manafort, who was recently indicted for conspiracy to launder money, conspiracy against the United States, uh, failing to register as a foreign agent of the Ukraine government in connection with all of his dealings, the one who was indicted by the Mueller-led investigation of Trump's collusion with Russia in the 2016 presidential election, he has sued in his own civil suit. He sued uh, Special Counsel Mueller and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who is appointed, who appointed Mueller in May and is tasked with overseeing the entire Trump-Russia uh, special counsel's operations. He sued them in a civil suit, alleging that the authority that Mueller has is way too broad, and he shouldn't be able to just investigate everything that he wants and then indict anyone that he wants, whether it's related to the Russia uh, collusion issue or not. The civil lawsuit uh, accuses Rosenstein of exceeding his legal authority, uh, like I said, to grant carte blanche uh, investigation uh, power and criminal charging power uh, to uh, special, Mueller, uh, special Counsel Mueller. The lawsuit demands that the investigation be reined in. In the meantime, Manafort has also filed for a dismissal of the charges against him for the money laundering and other crimes against the United States. While we're on the topic of dismissals, President Trump has announced uh, that he will be disbanding the Commission on Voter Fraud. Now, you all remember that even though he won the election, he still was making allegations that he only lost the popular vote because there was voter fraud. Uh, and in response, created a very controversial plan panel that was created to study this alleged voter fraud. Um, but nothing really happened except a bunch of federal lawsuits and a lot of resistance from the states that accused that commission of overreach. Uh, the decision is a major setback for Trump, who created that commission, as I said, uh, to, in response to his claim, for which he had no proof. Um, but he had to disband it because it was a complete waste of money and it wasn't doing anything at all. They actually, the commission only met twice amid the series of lawsuits seeking to curb its authority and then claims by Democrats that it was actually just an affront to actually suppress voting. That's probably some of the best news out of the White House that we've had in quite a while. We're going to take another quick commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to wrap up Prime News with international news and positive news.
news. It's time for international news. Quite a bit of conflict going on uh, overseas. Uh, if you've been paying any attention to social media, we've seen the tweet from Trump comparing the size and greatness of his nuclear button with that of North Korea's leader uh, and his nuclear button. Well, that was all in response to the North Korean leader's New Year's Day speech, where Mr. Kim continued his nuclear threat against Washington, D.C., saying he had a nuclear button ready to launch a weapon against any target in the United States at any time. But also in that same speech, Mr. Kim also proposed negotiations with South Korea to discuss easing military tensions on the divided Korean Peninsula and his country's possible participation in the Winter Olympics, which are being held in South Korea next month. For anyone who's been following the North Korea-South Korea conflict, this is huge. The fast-moving political developments have given new hope for a warming of ties between the two long-standing enemies of North Korea and South Korea. On this past Tuesday, South Korea's president, uh, who has been called for dialogue with the North Korea since his inauguration in May, quickly embraced Mr. Kim's offer of talks. His government proposed that high-level negotiators from both Koreas meet in a nearby town on the border next Tuesday to discuss the North's uh, Olympic participation. Seizing on Mr. Kim's outreach, South Korea was also has also urged uh, North Korea on Tuesday to reopen uh, a hotline, which is literally exactly what I'm saying, a phone hotline so that both sides could start preparations for high-level talks uh, proposal the North embraced on Wednesday. This is huge. As I said, as North Korea cut off all lines of communications with South Korea nearly two years ago. Yes, no communications between the two. So much so that a megaphone has been used at the border between these two countries in the last two years when someone needed to share urgent information with North Korea. So this reopening of, of a communications channel is a highly significant development because it is a step towards uh, being able to hold dialogue anytime between both sides. Over in the Middle East, in the Middle Eastern country of Iran, uh, the country is seeing the biggest civil unrest to strike in almost a decade. The protesting and demonstrating began less than a week ago, and it has quickly spread rapidly. The protests appear dominated by members of the working class uh, under the age of 25, who has suffered the most under Iran's very sluggish economy. Observers say that the partial lifting of sanctions that follow Iran's 2015 nuclear deal with the West delivered very uneven economic benefits to the country. And while middle class fortunes have been improved somewhat following the lifting of those sanctions, the members of the working class have been very, very vulnerable. In Iran, how bad is this economy? Well, here's some statistics. Inflation is at 12%, albeit it's down from the 40% at the start of the new president's first term in 2013, but um, unemployment is still very high. Youth employment is at 40%. More than 3 million Iranians are jobless, and the prices of some basic food items, such as poultry and eggs, have recently soared by almost half the cost. The protests began over economic grievances and soon took on a political dimension as protesters began to call on for I Iran's leadership, uh, including its supreme leader and its president, to step down and are voicing opposition to Iran's regional policy. Counter protests have begun as well by thousands of citizens who are resisting uh, the blame on the Iran leadership and are trying to prevent an overthrow of the Iranian government. Footage on national television and images published by state news agencies show a high turnout in pro-establishment rallies as well. Meanwhile, Trump continues to fan the flames of the controversy that he started in Palestine uh, in his anger at the Palestinian Authority from stepping away from the table in peace negotiations talk. Palestinian officials have said that they would no longer accept 
any peace plan put forward by the United States following Trump's unilateral decision on December the 6th when he also announced that the U.S. would begin a process of moving the U.S. Embassy from Israel in Israel and Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And of course, we all know when Trump said that Jerusalem belonged to the Israeli people. Uh, Trump says the U.S. gets no appreciation or respect from Palestinian Authority after it uh, recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And he keeps interjecting himself into the peace process uh, between the Israeli and, Palestini and Palestinians. This time, he has threatened to cut off financial aid from the United States to the Palestinian people. The U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, has echoed this statement by saying that the U.S. would indeed cut funds uh, to the UNRWA, which is the U.N.'s Agency for Palestinian Refugees, unless the Palestinian Authority went back to the negotiating table to recommence peace talks. Foreign diplomats and experts say that in threatening to cut off aid, and threatening to cut off these very huge payments to the Palestinians, Trump is actually posing a direct threat to Israel's security and well-being. American uh, aid supports training for Palestinian security forces who also have been partners uh, in preventing terror. Relations between administration and the Palestinian Authority have deteriorated since Trump said what he said last month recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. For those who want a number figure on how much aid the United States provides the Palestinian government, it's about $319 million in 2016, according to the U.S. government figures. All right, y'all, here's one of the favorite segments of the FCN uh, family. It's the positive news. You guys have all seen it on social media, Essence Communications, the 48-year-old publication and brand that owns Essence Magazine and the annual Essence Festival has gone back to black ownership, having been acquired by Essence Ventures LLC, an independent African-American-owned company. Yes, this means that this deal reestablishes Essence as a 100% black-owned independent company and the executive team is all black female led and they have an ownership stake in the brand now. Essence Ventures, which was founded and chaired by Liberian American, I'm gonna mispronounce his name, I believe it's Richelieu, is that right? Uh, Dennis, who was actually the founder of Shea Moisture, which we all know was acquired in November by the company Unilever. Essence currently reaches an audience of more than 16 million across its various platforms which includes the print magazine, uh, digital, video, and social media platforms, television specials, books, and live events, which most of us will recognize as the annual Essence Festival, which is a 22-year-old cultural celebration that attracts more than 450,000 attendees to New Orleans, at least it did this last summer. For those who want to know more about the deal, terms of that transaction have yet to be discussed closed. It's been a few weeks since Doug Jones, a Democrat, won the election for the open Senate seat in Alabama against the sexual predator, pedophile, racist, homophobe Roy Moore. Well, this week, Doug was sworn in by Vice President Pence for his new position, and one of his first items on his agenda was to assemble his cabinet. He has appointed in his first choice to appoint for chief of staff a black man as his chief of staff. Doug Jones has tapped former Department of Transportation staffer Dana, Dana Grisham, uh, making him the only African-American chief of staff for a Senate Democrat. Let that sink in. Prior to working at the, De the Department of Transportation uh, under President Barack Obama, Grisham worked for Republican Bud Kramer, a Democrat of Alabama, a Republican Arthur Davis, also a Democrat from Alabama. Gresham joins an elite group of Senate staffers. His hire, again, makes him the only African-American uh, chief of staff of a Democratic senator. However, he will join the ranks of two other African-Americans who are also staffers, but of Republican senators Tim Scott 
of South Carolina and Jerry Morin of Kansas, who, like I said, also have current uh, black chief, chiefs of staff. Serving as a Congressional Chief of Staff will be a familiar experience for Dana Grisham. This is the second time he has served as a Chief of Staff for an Alabama representative. From 2003 to November of 2008, Grisham was Chief of Staff for former House Re Representative Arthur Davis, also a Birmingham native. Uh, Grisham also worked for another Alabama representative, Bud Kramer, as Legislative Assistant and then Legislative Director. He began his career in Congressional politics as a staff assistant for North Carolina Democratic Representative Eva Clayton as well. He has a long history of being in this business, so congratulations to Mr. Gresham for his uh, selection as Chief of Staff for Doug Jones. In New York City, its city council voted to elect its city council speaker. Their choice, Corey Johnson, age 35, who is gay and the first person with HIV to be selected speaker. This position, for those who don't know, is the most powerful elected official uh, in city government after the mayor, of course. In his acceptance speech, Corey Johnson said, and I quote, we believe in a New York where no one is, should be targeted simply because of who they are. Muslim New Yorkers, immigrants, the undocumented, African-Americans, Jewish New Yorkers, transgender New Yorkers, we must reject hate in all of its forms and stand united against bigotry and racism. This new leader is expected to pose a challenge to the current mayor saying that he won't hesitate to push through bills over the mayor's veto, which never happened under his predecessor's never happened under his predecessor's uh, position. The Massachusetts native, age 35, recalled moving to New York at the age of 19 with two bags and no idea where he was going to live. He says that I want New York to be a place where you can still be 19 years old and come to New York and still survive. It's becoming more and more difficult if you don't come from a wealthy family to be able to do that here, he said. Congratulations to Mr. Uh, Corey Johnson for his selection for this position. Uh, it, it, it is a, a huge thing. Uh, actually, he won by a vote of 48 to 1. The one person who voted, the, uh, voted against him was a black woman who said, I've got to vote for someone black because New York has a lot of black residents and we believe that someone black should have the position. Well, guess not this day. All right, y'all. Well, that's it. What did y'all think about tonight's broadcast? Don't be shy at me. I can take anything you throw at me. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Tresne. Stay tuned uh, for the new show, True Baller Thursday, hosted by Jayco, for the premiere episodes of all things NBA basketball. This has been another episode of FCM Prime News with Tresne. I will see you guys all next Wednesday, at, next Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern.